And we believe that even this morning, God is going to give us the grace to teach and to preach this word. Amen. Amen. We are still in the beautiful book of Psalms. I know last week, Pastor Israel was in Psalms 24. And it's important, not just as a church, but in your own personal study time to always go into the book of Psalms. Amen. Because in the book of Psalms, it gives us wisdom on how to live a godly life, church. And it reminds us and stirs up what Pastor Mpo was praying about earlier this morning, that fire in our hearts, whether we are in a good season or a bad season. You will see in the Psalms, it's not always good. It's not always bad. Amen. But there is always praise. There is always a lifting up of God. And that's why for us as a church, as a ministry, and for you personally, it's important. And I want to encourage you, never let go of the Psalms, amen, included in your devotional time. I love what Calvin says about the book of Psalms. He says, it is the anatomy of all the parts of the soul, amen. He says that through the Holy Spirit, the book of the Psalm brings to life all grief, all sorrow, all fear, all doubt, all hope, all cares, all perplexities that are in our hearts and minds are found in the book of the Psalms. Amen. So that's why we teach it with so much passion and that's why we preach it. Even those in the New Testament, if you look at the Bible, the Psalms is one of the most quoted books from the Old Testament. Amen. When the apostles were faced with adversity, they would quote the Psalms. They would encourage themselves with the Psalms. And that's what we do even today as a church. We quote the Psalms. We encourage ourselves in the Psalms. And that's what we're going to do today. Amen. We're going to join in with the Christians of old who used to sing, who used to celebrate, who used to wail to the Psalms in different seasons of their lives. Amen. Amen. Now we're going to go into Psalm 46 this morning. And Psalm 46 is a very interesting psalm. It's one of the 55 psalms that are addressed to the chief musician. It is written by the sons of Korah. And this year and, and last year as well, we were learning that there were a group of Levites and they were dedicated musicians in the temple of God in the Old Testament, right? But it's also often labeled as a psalm of trust. Amen. Uh, if you look at Psalm 48 and 46 and 87, you'll also find that they are also called Psalms of Trust. But in short, they are songs of Zion that ultimately are there for the proclamation of God's universal reign. Amen. And another interesting point about Psalms 46 before I read it is it's said by many theologians that it was Martin Luther's favorite psalm was one of his favorite psalms. And although he studied the psalms and didn't see, Boki, uh, the doctrine of justification, it did encourage him a lot. And he used to, um, it is recorded that he used to call on his friends in times of trouble and he would say, come, let us sing the 46th psalm and let the enemy do his worst. Amen. And this morning we're going to sing, we're going to proclaim, and we're going to preach the Psalm 46, and we're going to say to the enemy, do your best. Amen. Amen. Come on, don't be afraid. Don't be scared. We're going we're gonna to proclaim it, and you'll hear it, and you will be confident at the end to say to the enemy, do your best. Amen. Amen. Psalm 46, I'm going to read it in the ESV, and it says this, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. He shall, she shall not be moved. 
God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice, the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come, behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought the desolations of the earth. He makes war cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. And I think if you've been saved long enough, you will know the next two verses. It says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Selah. Amen. Come on, give God a hand for that psalm. Amen. Come on, church. We could have just read it and gone home. Amen. Come on. But I, I, I will preach it. Amen. <laughs> I will preach it. Uh, this morning, I want to talk before we get into the psalm about a very important doctrine. And it is the doctrine of the immutability of God. Amen. The immutability of God. It is also known as the unchangeable nature of of God. This morning we sang, uh, Christ is my firm foundation, and we're able to build our lives on the solid foundation because he is immutable, because he's unchangeable. Amen. And now the first one, it says that the immutability of God means that God does not change in any way. He does not change. Malachi echoes this in Malachi 3.6. It says, I, the Lord, do not change. Amen. Number two, Grudem defines the immutability of God as follows. He says that God is unchanging in his being, in his perfections, in his purpose, and in his promises. He says God does act and feel emotion, and he acts and feels different according to the different situations. But he, in nature, is unchanging. And Psalms 102 echoes this. It says that of old you laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. They will wear out like a garment. You will change them like a robe, and they will pass away. But you are the same, and your years have no end. Amen. James also reminds us and says, do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Amen. So God existed before the heavens and the earth. Before all things were created, God was. And although the universe may change, God, the creator of all things, remains the same. Number three, the immutability of God is a necessary companion of his aseity. And the first time I also heard this word, Pastor Israel was teaching, hey, I went to home and I, I had to do some research and the aseity of God is this. It refers to God being eternally and completely of himself. The word comes from the Latin word and it's compound. So it's a and it means from and se, which means self. So to talk about the aseity of God then is to say that God is from and of himself. He is completely self-originating and dependent on nothing other than himself. And that is why he's never changing. Amen. Number four, God is unchanging in his purpose. Psalm 31, 11 says, The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart to all generations. So once God has determined to bring something to pass, church, his purpose is unchanging. And no one else is like God in this regard. 
Isaiah 46 reminds us of this. It says, For I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from the ancient times things not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all of my purpose. So further to God being unchanging in his purpose, I love this one. He's also unchanging in his promises. Come on. That ought to give someone some hope. Amen. So when God says and promises something, he's faithful to bring it to pass. It's unchanging. And that's why we speak with such a boldness, right? When we say that he's a man and cannot lie. And everything that he speaks will come to pass. So that's why when God has promised you something, you can stand on that word. Amen. What God has promised over your life, over this nation, over Africa, over your marriage, over your career, it stands because he's unchanging in his promise. Amen. And number five, the last point, at first glance, when you hear about the immutability of God, it may not seem important to affirm. But in order for us as God's creation to fully trust in him and to fully be dependent on him, it's important for us to affirm that he does not change. So his plan of redemption, his nature, his promises remain the same. And that's why even this morning, I think there was a lyric where we sang that we put our trust in in God and God alone. Amen. Come on, just give God praise right there. We believe and we appreciate and we're glad that we serve a God who is not changing. Amen. Now, as we go into the psalm, uh, I've broken it up into three stanzas. The first one being stanza one uh, from verse one to three, and it looks at God's presence. The second one, uh, stanza two from verse four to seven, speaks of God's protection. And as we close in stanza three from verse eight to 11, it speaks of God's power. Amen. So God in the beginning and God right through at the end. Amen. So as the psalmist opens up the psalm, he does it in a very beautiful way. Instead of opening by describing the magnitude of the bad situation, that's in verse 3 and in verse 2, he begins with acknowledging the provision of God. Because in life, when things get tough, and as we see in the scripture, when the seas roar in our personal lives, it's always so easy to start our prayers, our devotion, our worship by telling God how bad things are. Amen. But the psalmist challenges us here and reminds us the importance of approaching God from a position of faith and acknowledging first God's protection. I love uh, in the book of Luke 11 from verse 1 to 2, Jesus teaches his disciples. He says, pray this way. He says, start by saying, Lord, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. That's how the prayer starts and everything else after that. So even today when we model our prayer, it should start from a position of giving thanks to God. Amen. It's so important, church, and especially in the tough moments of our lives, not to be taken aback by what is happening, but to remember to start with a heart of gratitude. I love Psalms 100. It says, make a joyful noise to the Lord. All the earth, serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. No matter the situation, come before God with gladness and into his presence with singing. Church, the Christian walk is a walk of gratitude and thanksgiving. We're at the center of our focal point and everything that we concentrate on should be God. Not our circumstance and not the season that we are in. But it should be about who he is and what he has done. Amen. Amen. 
So when we live our lives this way, we are able then in all circumstances, and I love what Pastor Monet said, that in all circumstances, you learn to be a giver. And when we understand who God is, in every circumstance, we learn to be grateful. We start our prayers with gratitude. We start our week with gratitude. We start everything in our lives from a position of saying, God, thank you. I recognize who you are and what you have done. Paul also reminds us of the importance of leading a life of gratitude and acknowledging God for who he is in 2 Thessalonians. And it says, but we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, beloved by the Lord, because God chose you as his first fruit to be saved through sanctification by the spirit and believe in the truth. To this he called you through our gospel, so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So sometimes it may be hard when you've had a tough year to say, what do I anchor this gratitude on? But this scripture is very clear that we don't anchor our gratitude on circumstance. But we anchor our gratitude on these three things that the scripture gives us. Number one, we have been chosen by God to be saved. Amen. And that's justification. Number two, we have the gift of the Holy Spirit through the journey of sanctification. And thirdly, as if that wasn't enough, God is so good. We have the promise of glorification. So if we're doing the homework that Boki asked us to do, and you're not finding anything that can physically say that this was a good year, I will just ask that you go to Second Thessalonians and see that he has given you justification. He has given you sanctification, his Holy Spirit. And one day we will all receive the beautiful gift of glorification. Amen. Amen. Come on. God is so good. Amen. And then, amen. The next verse says, God is our refuge and he is our strength. So we see here how God's people acknowledge that God is their refuge and that he is their place of protection. And his power enables them when taking action in any battle. You know, Israel did not boast in armies and in any fortresses that they had built, but their boast was always in the one true living God. I love what Trapp says. He says, all creatures when in distress run to refuge. And it says in Proverbs 30, 26, the rock badgers are a feeble folk, yet they make their homes in the crags. So in the face of adversity, who do we run to? And that's a question that we all need to ask ourselves. Do we run to our ability? Do we run to our own strength? Do we run to what used to work in the past? Do we run to sin for comfort, for temporary comfort to numb the pain? Do we run to people? Do we run to man? Or as the psalmist says, do we cry out to God who is the true refuge and the true strength? And I pray that this morning our disposition will always be to run to God. Amen. Amen. It's so important, church, every season of our lives, especially when we face hard times, that it's in those seasons when we are mourning that we actually run to God for comfort. Because what the enemy wants to deceive you in is that you need to run to sin. Amen? And we know that the sin easily ensnares us with a promise of what is good in the moment that ends in death at the end. But there is healing, there is peace, there is restoration, and there is joy when we run into the presence of God. Amen. And I love what it says in the last part of this verse. It says, a very present help in trouble. It doesn't say a present help. It says, a very present help in trouble. And it's usually in the moments where we walk through the valley of the shadow of death of our lives. When life gives us trials and tribulations, that we need to remember that God is near. It's so good to know that God is God, amen, but to 
know that God is near is so beautiful. Um, I love what uh, A.W. Tozer, he was doing research on the knowledge of the Holy Spirit, and he says, the doctrine of divine omnipresence personalizes man's relation to the universe in which he finds himself. God is present near him, next to him, and this God sees him and knows him through and through. What a better place to go when you're facing trial to a God who knows you, who has formed you, who sees you, who knows your beginning from your end, right? It is only in his presence. So much um, is he a creator of the universe. He still makes this decision to be very present. I love what Morgan says. He says, the secret of the confidence that we have is our consciousness of the nearness of God. So sometimes when you're walking into work and things are bad, we were talking about the elections now, and people seem to be in a panic, and they ask why you're not panicked. It's exactly because of this. We have the consciousness of knowing that we have a God who is near. Amen. I love the song that we usually sing here at church, uh, by Forward Church, by Travis Green's church. And the lyrics say, closer than close, there is no distance with us. My heart is yours. So I pray that in the darkest moments of your lives, in the darkest moments of our lives, that the brightest place that we will go to is at the feet of our Father. Amen. As we go into the second verse, it says, Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. Selah. So you see that verse 2 starts with an important word, and I think we have studied it quite a bit, the word therefore. Amen. Come on, all the theologians in the house. They already know where I'm going with this. And it means that for this reason or because of this, that is why we use the word therefore. And we see that the psalmist declares that we will not fear. Though these things that are terrible that are mentioned in verse 1, there is a reason why we don't fear because God is our refuge and God is our strength. Amen. We are not without hope, church. We are to react to situations differently. We are to respond to the things that we see in the world differently because we know our true refuge and we know our true strength. Amen. Spurgeon once said, with God on our side, how irrational would fear be? How irrational would fear be where he is all-powerful? He is all love. Why therefore should we quail when we serve the true and living God? Amen. Come on, church. I pray that this week, whatever situation you face, that you won't go to fear. Because you know the God that you serve. The God that holds you. The God that covers you. Amen. So as children of God, we don't approach any situation with fear. Because we know what the word says. And that's why it's important to study the word of God. You know, we don't just say study the word so you can sound smart. You study the word because you know when you're faced with adversity. You know how to respond as a child of God. Amen. Amen. You know, the language in this verse may symbolize commotion. Changes that occur in nations. Nations that rise and that fall. But as we just studied now in the doctrine of immutability, God remains the same through it all. Through the elections, through the wars that are started, that are stopped, God remains the same. He is never changing. We may not be able to count on good health in the future or money in the bank or investments or friends or even our capabilities. But one thing that we can always count on is God, because he is sure and he is firm. Amen. And this verse ends in a beautiful way. It says, Selah. 
And I, I will, um, I'll repent. You know, growing up, I never used to read this word. Sometimes I used to think there, there's some kind of typing error that happened um, and used to skip by it. But, you know, this year being very intentional with studying the word, we know that everything is intentional in the word of God. Amen. So in the Bible, the meaning of the word Selah is a Hebrew word. And it's been highly debated, but likely it indicates a pause or an interlude to a song or to a poem. And it is a time to reflect on what has just been said or what has just been sung. So in this psalm, we see the word Selah a total of not once, but three times. After each stanza, it says Selah. A call to take a pause and give careful thought and meditate on what we just heard about the God that we serve. Amen. And you know, this word I pray this morning will be something that will come in our daily lives. That every day we will say Selah. In the morning, in the afternoon, in the evening. During trials, during high moments, low moments, we will learn to say, Selah, meditate on the word of God, on the promises of God. In our personal devotion, how many times do we go in, study the scripture, say the prayer for the day, and rush out? But I pray that this week is the week where we will say, Selah, and just meditate on what God has done and meditate on who God is. Amen. Amen. And you will see, as you have these moments where you say Selah, you will begin to rightly size God in your life. And you will begin to see that he is the object of all that we are. And the trials and the tribulations will begin to fade away. You'll begin to look at whatever it is that you're going through, through the lens of who God is in your life. Amen. Amen. So I pray this morning that this week will be a sailor week for you. Every day, in every moment. Amen. Amen. We're going to go to stanza two, God's presence. Amen. Now, in contrast to verses two to three, the psalmist takes us from a scene where there is imagery of raging waters and mountains trembling to a calm river whose streams make glad the city of God. We are now transported to a scene that is filled with peace, where the scripture states that this city is the holy habitation of the Most High. And you know, as I was studying this word, uh, the shift in the natural disasters from the previous word uh, verses to where we are now is almost a depiction of our lives, amen? That sometimes things can be going so chaotic and quickly go so bad. And sometimes things can be so bad and quickly become so peaceful. Amen. But I love what it says. It says, at the center of the city, there is a river. At the center of our life, church, there is something that is stable. There is something that is constant. There is something that's not moved by what's happening around us. And that is God Almighty. Amen. You know, it's interesting that the psalmist also writes about a river in the city of God when historians know that unlike many capital cities in the world now, anciently and modernly, Jerusalem does not have a pleasant river that flows through its city. So the prophets of this time, at that time, before they even beheld what Jesus did on the cross, they anticipated a day when a mighty river would flow from the temple itself. Come on, church, I don't know about you, but how much more when we have beheld Jesus on the cross, Jesus resurrected, that we know this for sure, that we know that he's the river of life that flows in every situation in our lives. Amen. Amen. This stanza closes in such a powerful way it's almost a declaration. The psalmist declares, the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge, Selah. And this confession reminds us of the opening verse concerning the presence of God and his protection. 
against the backdrop of the ungodly nations, the natural disasters, and the raging storms, the psalmist still declares that there is stability for the people of God. And that is the presence of God. We see that God is identified in two very unique ways. It says, the Lord of hosts and the God of Jacob. And as the Lord of hosts, God commands armies both in heaven and in the entire universe. Amen. So the title appears first in Samuel when Hannah actually prayed and requested for a son. And this title we associate with the acknowledgement that nothing is too hard for God. So today, church, I also want to remind you that as we cry, the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob, our refuge, reminds us that nothing is too hard for God in our lives. Nothing is too hard for God in our lives. What God has intended to do, amen, he will do it. And I love also the second part. It says that he is the God of Jacob. He is our refuge. Now, this title identifies God as Israel's God. It personalizes it. Amen. Who keeps the promises he made to Jacob and his descendants. So the people of Jerusalem believed that no power on earth could destroy them because the Lord of hosts, the God of Jacob, was with them and was their refuge. And this reminds us that no matter what may be taking place in our lives, even when there's instability in the world, there is one thing that we can hold on to, and that is the presence of God, knowing that there's surety in what he has spoken and what he has said. And because we know that he is unchanging and he remains the same. Amen. Amen. And that's why in the midst of the storm, we are able to still say, the Lord is with us. And acknowledge that he is our refuge. Amen. 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 And as we go to stanza three, and this is titled God Exalted. And there is a call out to all nations to come and behold the works of the Lord. And what he has done for his people. Everson suggests that this call, as maybe some of us may think, is not only for the enemies of God. Amen. Amen. But it was for the Israelites who were wavering in their faith. And the psalmist invites us here to say that when you are wavering in your faith, go back and behold the works of God. Yeah. Amen. And it just reminds me of what we did last month when people were standing here and sharing their testimonies. Yeah. What they were doing was beholding the work of the Lord yeah. and what God has done. And it's so important, church, when you feel that your hope and your faith is fading, don't try and, you know, rile yourself up or do it in your own strength to believe or to be excited again. Go to the word of God and behold what God has already done. And the greatest thing God has done is he has given us his son. And also keep a track record of what God has done in your life. And whenever the enemy wants to come in and creep in with the lies to say that God is not good, you have a track record. You have a testimony. You know, I was, um, I put Mulebukheng and Lagato on the spot. Uh, They shared so beautifully the testimony of their five-year marriage on, on WhatsApp yesterday. And what they were doing was beholding the works of God and what he has done. And therefore, they can continue to put their trust in him as they continue in their marriage. So I want to encourage you as well, study the word of God. Study God's promises. So when fear and when your faith is wavering, you can say, no, I know what the Lord has done. Amen. 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 Uh, You know, the scripture um, is not clear. And some actually think that in the scripture... It was summoned by King Hezekiah, and there was a war that was waged by the kingdom of Assyria, and they attempted to actually, 
you know, dethrone or they attempted to rage, you know, a disastrous war against Jerusalem. And God came through in a miraculous way in this war. And in this instance, we saw how the people of Israel just stood still and beheld what God would do for them in this war. And sometimes, you know, we can think that um, we are not the enemies of God. But that's because Jesus came. Yeah. We were once enemies of God. Yeah. But through the work of the cross and the atoning work, we are now friends of God. Yeah. And all we had to do was stand and be still and behold the salvation of the Lord. There's a song that I love by Israel Houghton, the, the great Israel Houghton. And it simply just says, stand still, stand still and see the amazing salvation of the Lord. And I want to invite you into this week, I want to invite you into the rest of this year to stand still and see the amazing salvation of what God has done in your life. Amen. You know, the psalm closes with a repetition of verse 7. It says, the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Now, this repetition is a reminder to us of the importance of knowing that God is in control. He alone is our protection and our place of refuge. He alone can do what we couldn't do ourselves. Amen. You know, that's why Solomon could write this amazing scripture. In Proverbs 18.10, he could say, The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous man runs into it and is safe. Amen. Amen. And in the closure of the psalm, it reminds us that while we were dead in our own sin, and we didn't even know we were dead. Only he could come in and give us a regenerated spirit and brought us back to life again. Amen. So by faith and by trusting in Jesus Christ alone, we receive the great gift of salvation. Amen. Now, church, this morning, the psalm, there is a call to stand still and see the glorious work of the Lord and this week, I want to ask you to ask God to show you the part of your life where you have lost the awe and wonder of God and to remind you by his Holy Spirit the works of God in your life, in your family, in your career, how he has brought you from when you were young till today, that in the busyness of life that we don't forget to call out to God and to behold his beauty, and to behold his greatness. Amen. I want to invite us to stand. As we go one verse back in this psalm, it says that, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations, and I will be exalted in this earth. And it's beautiful how we see that in this verse, it feels like God comes in and speaks, takes over from the third person and speaks as himself and says, be still and know that I am God. And that's the invitation this week. I want to invite you this week to Selah, to be still and know that he alone is God. He alone is unchangeable. He is the firm foundation in your life. Though the seas may roar, though nations may wage against each other, God remains the same. Amen. Let us pray. Just lift up your hands. Father, we thank you this morning for your word. We thank you, Father, that as we approach your throne with thanksgiving and gratitude, we behold the beauty of what you have done. We behold the beauty of Jesus Christ on the cross who died for our sins that we may be redeemed. Father, we thank you that no matter what may be taking place in our lives, that we can run into your presence and know that we are safe. 
Father, I pray that going into this week and the rest of this year, into the rest of our lives, Lord God, let us never miss our opportunity to heed to the call to stand still and behold that you alone are God. Father, we thank you this morning that you are unchanging, that you are an immutable God, that your promises truly are yes and amen, that everything that you have intended to do in our lives will come to pass. So we speak against any form of fear, any doubt, Lord God, any anxiety that may be in this room. We speak your word and your promises, Lord. And we thank you that because we know that you are unchanging, God, that you are a firm foundation, that whatever you have promised, whatever you have said in your word, surely will will come to pass over our lives. Father, we thank you that your word is true over many generations. And even today, as we stand, Lord God, we grab a hold of your word. We thank you for your provision. We thank you for your promise. We thank you for your power. We thank you, Lord God, for your presence. And we make a commitment this week that we will run into your presence whether we are in the low moments of our lives, whether we are in the high moments of our lives, Lord, teach us to run and remain in your presence. Teach us to live a life of gratitude, not because of the things that we see, Lord, but because of who you are and what you have done through the works of Jesus Christ. Father, I pray for everyone in this room, everyone who is starting to lose hope, Lord God. I pray that today they will be reminded that they serve a God who doesn't change. That what you have said will come to pass. I pray, Lord, for those who have lost heart, those who have had a tough year, Lord God, I pray that you will encourage them in your word. I pray that you will encourage them, Lord God, as they study the word this week. They will see, Lord, what you have done for the Israelites. They will see how you parted seas. They will see, Lord God, how you caused older women to give birth. You will, they will see, Lord God, how you fed thousands, Lord, from very little. They will see it in your word. And they will know that you are the same God then that you are today. And if you did it then, you will do it for them right now oh we honor you lord we exalt you father we come in agreement with the psalmist we say you are our refuge and you are our strength let all of our lives be us standing still and beholding your beauty let us never lose our wonder for you lord let us always stand in amazement of who you are and what you have done we honor you, Lord God. We thank you and we bless your holy name. Amen and amen. Amen. Come on, give God praise. He is our refuge and our strength. Amen. Amen. It's so good uh, to have had.